Slicing through the skies in an untested plane is a deadly risk. In the old days, it might have meant a broken leg or a twisted ankle. But today, armed fighters are catapulted. Jets loaded with human cargo lumber off and rockets blast to space. These are not situations where we can afford to find out if an engine will stall, rotors will jam or wings will snap off. The answer? If we can put machines in the skies, why not bring the skies to the machines? That's exactly what NASA has done. The Ames Research Center in the Bay Area of California tests the stresses of flying by putting grounded planes to the test. The wind tunnel was actually built with uh, the idea of putting a, a full-size 737 aircraft in it. It's the largest wind tunnel on Earth, nearly five football pitches in length, and virtually every major American aircraft developed over the last 30 years has been tested in this facility. Increasing fan blade angle to 45 degrees. Testing with models at full scale gives researchers more reliable data than working with scaled down versions. 45.5. There are fewer variables to consider, giving NASA real world results. Instead of making the aircraft cut through wind, they anchor the aircraft in and blast wind at them, essentially creating the effects of flight. Only down on the ground, they can view turbulence down to the last detail. If you go into the uh, control room, you'll see banks and banks of computers and equipment to measure the forces and moments. And it can be a model that doesn't, doesn't, isn't flyable. If you're just studying the wings, uh, often we would test models without a tail, and you put an instrumentation where the tail would go to see what the effect of the wing is on that position. This fixture that's mounted in the 80 by 120 foot uh, test section is a, called the rotor test apparatus. It's a piece of NASA hardware that we use to test helicopter rotors from different helicopter companies. Besides testing individual parts, NASA can test for specific capabilities, allowing certain aircraft to press the envelope of high performance. We had a, uh, an F-18 aircraft that we installed in the wind tunnel uh, doing very high angle of attack studies. And we went up to 60 degrees angle of attack with an F-18 at 115 miles per hour. What they're testing is how a pilot controls an F-18 aircraft at very high attitudes. It's the only facility where you can do that with a full-size aircraft at, uh, at those speeds. But how they generate these gale force winds is a complex science in itself. They start with a gigantic air-sucking chamber. A person standing next to the intake is reduced to a speck. This is the atmospheric inlet of the 80 by 120 foot wind tunnel. The atmospheric inlet is about four times larger than the test section. The inlet's about the size of a football field tilted up on its edge. That inlet is the slow start to the air's ever faster journey. It sounds like a death trap, capable of sucking up and spitting out everything that crosses its path. But that's not the case. If you were standing in front of this inlet out here when we're running at full power, the speed out in front of this inlet is about 25, 30 miles per hour. So uh, the worst thing that will happen is your tile gets sucked up against the screen. So how does a cool breeze outside this gaping mouth turn into a high velocity gale? First, the air funnels through the inlet into these massive veins measuring 12 stories high and 160 feet wide. Because the veins are smaller than the inlet, the airflow picks up speed as it moves towards the test section. This is the test section of the 80 by 120 foot wind tunnel. The wind tunnel gets its name from the size of the test section, which is 120 feet wide and 80 feet tall. On the opposite end of the test section is the power behind the force, a bank of six fans that pulls the air into the test section, then pumps it back into the atmosphere. And like everything else, these fans are huge. 
the new ones weighed 200 tons. They completely assembled the new drive units uh, in the shop outside the tunnel and then brought them in with a special dolly that had 112 wheels. Each fan is the height of a four-story building with giant blades that need constant care. We uh, do a lot of uh, maintenance and inspections of the facility to keep it running. We have people that, that every day before we run, they walk through the circuit with flashlights, making sure that there's no debris, uh, FOD for an object damage uh, potential in the, in the wind tunnel. We wouldn't want to send anything through the fans. The blades are made of a wood composite injected with plastic, then compressed. They're 15 blades per fan, making a wall of 90 whirling blades. Each fan motor at full power uses uh, 26,000 horsepower, and the full set of six draws 106 megawatts at full power. 106 megawatts is uh, about what a small city, maybe 30,000 people, draws on a typical day. Because the wind tunnel is a test facility, that means whatever can go wrong with an aircraft will go wrong in here, and accidents do happen. Uh, one of the infamous ones was a Cheyenne helicopter. Uh, it was a, it was a multi $400 million program, and uh, they had crashed, one of the planes had crashed, and so we put one of the helicopters in the tunnel, and it came apart in the tunnel and tossed the tip weight through the wall, and after that we put in armor plate. <laughs> On top of pushing the limits of existing technology, the wind tunnel is used to test new and strange designs. It was kind of fun because we were always defining, well, what's flyable? And so we would do these experiments in the tunnel, and then they would take the data and put it in the simulator, and a pilot would try and fly it in the simulator. And eventually we got to where they said, yeah, we think we can fly this. So many new ways to fly thanks to what's essentially a great big hall with a huge stack of fans sucking air in through one end and blowing it out the other. Even after years of coming to work at NASA, this place continues to amaze Pete Zell. For me personally, it's, uh, it's the opportunity to work with very large toys, uh, basically. Uh, the wind tunnel models uh, uh, have the same types of uh, problems and, and challenges as building uh, scale model airplane models so that obviously kids like to do so I feel like a, a big kid in a lot of ways working here a big kid in a big place a place that's not only made its mark down here but will continue to make an even bigger mark up there The Akashi Kaikyo Bridge is the largest, longest, tallest suspension bridge in the world. Suspension bridge meaning just hanging by wires. Karino Sumitaka manages the entire bundle of steel, cable and concrete. Whether he's inspecting the foundation or checking the cable connections, he's responsible for making sure everything is doing what it should. From deep beneath the ground, to the continuous columns of girders to every nut, bolt, and screw that holds it all together, right to the very top. Up here, caution is essential, because courage and a safety line are your only security. This is the highest point of the bridge, and the height is around 300 meters from the sea level. A fall from here would be like a leap from the Eiffel Tower. This bridge is about eight times longer than New York's Brooklyn Bridge. It's one of the world's busiest waterways, on an average day, about 1,400 vessels pass through. The bridge couldn't interfere with that. This is why the towers are so far apart. They leave a single opening of one and a quarter miles. And the clearance is astounding, almost 300 feet high. It dwarfs the largest of cargo ships. 
top-heavy loads, even supersized floating cranes drift right underneath with plenty of room to spare. Most boats don't even reach as high as the bridge's foundation. Building this was a huge undertaking. They broke ground in 1988, and they broke it 60 meters beneath the ocean's surface. In fact, if New York's Statue of Liberty stood where their foundations are laid, she'd still be about 14 meters shy of breaking the surface of the water. But the foundation structures are tons of times bigger than the Statue of Liberty. It took a flotilla of tugboats to haul the giant round shells called caissons. Each one is as tall as a 25-story building with a diameter of 260 feet. And when they're settled in, they still stand above the waterline. Now they were ready to erect the towers onto the foundations. Gigantic floating cranes and helicopters lifted parts and put them into place. The towers would serve as the super high saddles upon which the main cables would rest. The cables are massive in themselves. This cable total length is four kilometer, uh, continuous uh, cables uh, and uh, uh, diameter is 1.1 meter. Close by is a public display. 290 hexagonal strands are lumped together in one big core. In each hexagonal strand is another 127 wires. The cables contain enough wire to circle the planet seven and a half times. They're thick because they're built to hold the weight of a 100,000 ton bridge deck. To get the cable in place, a helicopter ran the pilot lines from one shore to the other. Next, workers gave themselves a surface to stand on by laying out catwalks along the pilot lines. Then one by one, they stretched out hundreds of individual strands, bundled those strands together for strength, then squeezed till they couldn't be squeezed anymore. Those thick supporting lines take root deep inside the anchorages. It's like a giant wire brush, where the roots alone are larger than the men who inspect them. Each individual strand is separated and pulled down into these clamps. This helps to evenly distribute the immense force pulling on the cables. It takes a lot of leverage, a lot of steel, and a lot of concrete to hold these lines. Each anchorage facility alone weighs a whopping 350,000 tons. That's over three times the weight of the actual bridge deck. The sheer weight of the bridge isn't the only concern of the engineers. They had to face the elements. Bridge building history makes clear that wind can add a deadly burden if the design isn't right. But engineers in Japan came up with a solution. From beneath, you can see steel girders stretching from one end to the other. This is the first defense against wind. Here is the inside of the girder, and it weighs 90,000 tons. The 90,000 tons of triangular shapes and crisscross patterns allow the solid metal beams to brace themselves against the forces. The bridge also has vertical stabilizers under the middle of the deck. The stabilizers reduce wind vibration by balancing the pressures on the upper and lower surfaces of the bridge. The next challenge was to keep the towers from toppling. Rather than putting up more bracing, engineers added more motion to the towers with these little pendulum-like devices called mass dampers. Their back and forth motion counteracts the sway generated by high winds or by an earthquake. In 1995, just after the two towers were raised and the main cables were laid, the engineer's concept was put to the test. The Kobe earthquake in Japan had a magnitude of 7.2. It claimed over 5,000 lives and destroyed more than 100,000 buildings. The epicenter was only two and a half miles from the bridge, but the towers remained standing, the cables still in place, the anchors at both ends intact. But not without a hitch. The shift in the ground added an extra meter of distance between the two towers. A few minor adjustments solved the problem and work continued. The giant girder blocks were put into position with huge floating cranes. Then they connected them to the main cables, 
fire this long network of hanging lines, forming the basis for the bridge deck. The biggest and bulkiest of the work was behind them. A few finishing touches, and Japan had the biggest suspension bridge in the world. This is the largest building by volume in the, in the world. Uh, you could put Disneyland in here, including its parking, and still have about 12 acres left over. So it's about 4.3 million square feet. Um, you could put uh, a little over 2,100 average-sized homes in this factory. 98 acres under one roof is, is pretty phenomenal. When you're building the biggest commercial airliners on Earth, and you're building dozens of them in the same room at the same time. You need a lot of space. And the Boeing plant in Everett, Washington, needs every inch of it. This building was built to be able to produce 21 airplanes a month, and that's seven on the 747 line, seven on the 67 line, and seven on the 777. It takes months to complete the assembly of an aeroplane, but through a massive coordinated effort, the plant is packed with millions of plane parts, growing into giant-sized jets right before your eyes. Everything must slip into place. When the plant is at maximum output, it produces more planes than any other factory on Earth. You're bringing in the smaller parts, joining them together, making bigger pieces, joining them with other big pieces, making even bigger pieces, until you have a fully assembled aircraft. Not only are these planes tall, they've got wingspans of over 200 feet. And once you've built something of such bulk, you need an opening of monstrous proportions to get it outside. The doors are some of the largest doors uh, probably on any building in the world. Uh, they're 350 feet wide on the uh, 777 high bays, 87 feet high. If you were to lay them down, you're virtually looking at a, uh, a football field, an American football field. On the other side of those towering doors is a 24-hour day. Every day, including weekends and holidays. Parts are lifted, transported and lowered into place. All this activity keeps a lot of people busy. There's probably about 10,000 people in this factory at any given time during the daytime. Uh, we have about 30,000 employees on this site, and that's over three shifts. But the facility is so gigantic that the population looks sparse. That's to be expected when people are scattered throughout an area so big that its total volume is about the same as 13 Empire State Buildings. It takes quite a bit to get around in here. We have electric-powered vehicles, we have gas-powered vehicles, a lot of bicycles. We have expediters that move parts, small parts, through this factory. Uh, they ride a lot of bicycles around to get from one end to the other end. Crossing the interior of this building is like crossing 57 football pitches. And while workers are scurrying down below, a network of cranes are suspended on rails 90 meters up. There's approximately 32 miles of track uh, for the overhead cranes for them to operate off of what we call our overhead crane highway. That highway is home to a network of 18 different cranes, all suspended by this maze of track. Different cranes carry different loads, and some can be very heavy. That means in some cases there's the equivalent of about 150 full-grown elephants hanging from the roof. And with the skilled guidance of the man at the controls and the workers on the floor, the assemblies are lowered into position, down to the last millimeter. So how do they keep the roof from falling in? First of all, they couldn't have columns of support running through the middle of the plant. There are just too many big parts moving in too many different directions. So they had to get creative and reinforce the roof in a different way. This is the answer a hidden maze of steel trusses that support the overhead cranes. We have a 28-foot uh, depth on the trusses, 
and that's basically because we need to support a span of 300 feet as well as a 34-ton crane overhead and the parts that it moves around the factory. Below ground level is another hidden world. 15 feet down, corridors cross-connect the departments above. There's uh, about 2.3 miles of tunnels underneath this facility that uh, we use for emergency egress as well as for fallout shelters. These tunnels provide shortcuts to various locations within the building. By using them, you don't have to navigate past the aircraft. Some 275,000 cubic yards of concrete were poured to create this structure. That's enough concrete to pave 44 miles of four-lane motorway. We use enough power in this facility on an annual basis to power about 32,000 homes for, for, a, uh, for a year. The bill for that is around $11 million a year. This facility is, is pretty much like its own little city. We are pretty well self-contained here. And our services, our fire department, our security forces uh, will support the local community if a, a need arises. If we have an emergency out in the community, we've been able to send our fire department out to help, or we've been able to send our security folks out also. And just like any city, the plant even has its own urban legends. Local folklore has it that this place has its own weather patterns inside. Uh, the rumor that this building basically has its own atmosphere is, is kind of a myth. It's a big building, but it does not have its own atmosphere. It might not rain inside, but outside, weather concerns are very real. If you're lifting apart and we have snow on the roof, it has to be calculated in so that you don't drop a crane, right, or bring the roof down when you're lifting apart and there's snow on the roof. Worryingly, this building is located near Seattle, where rainfall is famously heavy. But no storm will flood this facility. They have a vast system of engineered wetlands and holding ponds. One of them can hold 20 million gallons. That's big enough to float an ocean-going ship. And so perhaps it's appropriate that this massive plant builds today's biggest liners of the skies. Perhaps it's equally appropriate to tell you that we've more big stuff next Tuesday at 8. We're back to tonight, and at 9, a special effects designer is wanted by the police. Not because he's done wrong, but because they need him to help trap a dangerous criminal. FX2, starring Brian Brown and Brian Dennehy, is Tuesday's big film at 9. Before that, we bid a fond farewell to the house doctor. Details of her final patient for now, in moments.